shall not be moved. I shall not be moved just like a tree planted by the water. I shall not be moved on my way to glory land, and I shall not be moved on my way to glory land. like a tree planted by the water I shall not be Jesus is my Savior, and I will not be moved. Jesus is my Savior, and I will not be moved. Just like a tree planted by the water, I shall not be moved. be to God, I will not be moved. Glory be to God, now I will not be moved just like a tree planted by the water. I shall not be moved. I shall not, I shall not be moved. Just like a tree planted by the water, I shall not be moved. No, I shall not be moved. Hello, brothers, this is Christ. If you haven't watched part one, please go watch part one of uh, put on, let's see, stand and prove thyself with the whole armor of God, okay? And we talked about, just a recap of part one, we talked about the Bible time and time again, talking about standing for the Word of God. And when you stand for the Word of God, the Word of God talks to us about how we're supposed to put on the whole armor of God. And we talked about the three enemies that prevent you from putting on the whole armor of God. Okay, recap of the enemies. The lust of the flesh. Okay, you're not supposed to make provision for the flesh to fill the, fulfill the lust there are. The lust thereof. We're supposed to put on the whole armor of God. The armor of light, which we're going to get into. We talked about um, you're not supposed to walk in darkness when you put on the armor of light. Okay, it's contrary one to another. We talked about not being um, caught up uh, with the affairs of this life. The world. Remember the the flesh is the enemy, the world is the enemy, and being vigilant and not getting deceived by the enemy. Okay, Those are the, the, the all-time three enemies that prevent us from putting on the armor of God. And when we take off the armor of God, it makes it very hard to put the armor of God back on. But in part two, we're now going to go through the pieces of armor of God and explain in more detail what they are. And how to determine whether someone has it on or not. What prevents them from putting it on. And each individual piece. But remember, get a little ahead of myself. We're supposed to put on the whole armor of God. One piece, all it takes is Satan getting you to take off one piece of armor. And that's it. You're done. One piece of armor and you're done. And why? Because when you take off one piece, you take off another. You take off another. And the next thing you know, you're naked. Spiritually speaking. You don't have the armor of God on anymore. Okay. Turn to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. Okay. 
verse 10, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. So we're going to get into the armor of God in this one. It says here, finally, finally, remember this is Ephesians, this is the end of Ephesians. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. How do you be strong in the Lord and the power of his might? Verse 11, put on the whole armor of God by putting on the whole armor of God. Now we're going to get into this. That ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Remember the three enemies, the lust of the flesh. Okay, that says we wrestle not against flesh and blood. It's talking about other people, but we do wrestle with this body of flesh. We've got to put this flesh down all the time. But it's talking about when it comes to the world. Our battle is spiritual. It's not physical. We don't go out and force people to get saved. I, can't, I don't go out there and force you, brothers and sisters in Christ, to do what's right by this book. I can encourage you, exhort you through the Scriptures. I can correct you in the Scriptures. I can rebuke you in the Scriptures. I can try to let the Holy Spirit convict you that, hey, you need to get lined up with this book. But in the end, I give you the truth. Take it or leave it. My battle is spiritual. Okay. Our battle is spiritual. Here it is, verse 13. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God. The whole armor of God. First it says, put on the whole armor of God. Then it says, wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God. Not just a piece. You don't get to pick what pieces of armor you like and which pieces you don't. You're to put the whole thing on. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand! Remember? Don't faint, don't falter. We're supposed to be of the same mind, the same judgment, striving together. When I was doing this study, I was wondering, could this be a way to tell whether a bro someone's truly saved or born again? And born again? Truly saved and born again? Or could this be a t test also to tell whether someone, he once met this standard, but now he doesn't? So this, could this be a brother or sister in Christ that's falling away? When you start taking off the armor of God, you're falling away. You had it on, but you took it off. And we're going to talk about that. So let's get into the first portion. It says, verse 14, Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth. Now, we have a Bible study video on some of the armors of God. I haven't gotten through every piece individually where we hit it hardcore with all the scriptures. But this one we do. When it says girt about with truth, people think it's just a belt to hold your pants up. That's not what this is. This is an action. When you gird up your loins, it's an action. And you gird up your loins so you can hook the sword to your, your waist. Now, could you put a belt on and so you could hook a sword to your waist? Yeah. But when you actually look up, we did a study on this, looking up girding up your loins. What it means is, is it's an action. And men used to wear robes. So you would gird up your loins and wrap the robe around you to make them look like pants. Like shorts, almost. And you would have uh, hooks on the scabbard. If you know what a scabbard is, scabbard is what holds the sword. The sword goes into the scabbard, and the scabbard had some chains on it and some hooks. And the hooks would hook around that girding up action you did. You did that action so you could put the sword on. And we talk about this. When you do that action, you did that action when you went to work. You gird up your loins when you go to work. And you gird up your loins when you go to war. Okay. What do I believe this is talking about? This is talking about 2 Timothy 2.15. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Thy word have I hid in my heart, that I might not sin against thee. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Thy wor words are pure words, therefore thy servant loveth it. What's the first part of the armor of God that it talks about? It talks about an action. Girding up your loins. What is that? The Bible says, buy the truth and sell it not. You're hunting down the truth, and once you find the truth, you hold on to it, and you don't let it go. And you work, you study. Why do we study this? So then we can go to war with it. There's none righteous, no, not one. All these false religions that are, are even the repentantless gospel religions. There's none righteous, no, not one. There's none that understandeth. There's none that seeketh after God. They've altogether become unprofitable. There's none that doeth good, no, not one. The wages of sin is death. 
But the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. We take this and we go to war with it. When we preach it, when we hide it in our heart and live it. But the first step is studying this book and believing in this book. In part one, we threw out a lot of verses about it effectually worketh also in you that believe. If you believe this isn't the words of men, but as in truth the words of God that effectually worketh also in you that believe. We talked about how you have to believe this is God's perfect written word, the King James Bible. Then, and only then, can you take it and start girding your loins up with truth. It's the action of studying the Word of God. You start out by reading it. It's so important, Brothers Christ, you read the Word of God every morning. You start your day with the Word of God. You end your day with the Word of God. Okay? You can't get enough of the Scriptures. You hide it in your heart and you live it. It's now God's the boss. It's God's commands that mean anything. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the good understanding have all they that keep His commandments. This is the whole duty of man. Fear God and keep His commandments. Well, what are God's commandments? You have to seek the truth. And when you find the truth, you don't sell it. You hide it in your heart, and you live it. Right? This is the most important step, because, brothers, is Christ, you know what brought me to Christ, the true plan of salvation? The Bible version issue. I had NIV, uh, the message. I had, I think, maybe a, a, a New American Standard. I had like three or four different Bible perversions. And I wasn't reading. They were gathering dust. And I was, I was done with organized religion. And I called myself a Christian. But I came out of the easy believism, the free grace, where they're basically, you don't ask God to save you. You just take salvation. You don't come to God broken and let Him give you salvation. You just take it. You just take it. It's no longer a gift, and faith becomes works. Remember Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. You preach that to the world when you preach it properly. It says, for by grace are you saved. What saves us? God's grace. And every part of this book, it's always God's grace that does the saving. Every, when I say every part, every dispensation, every time period in history, all the way back to Adam and Eve, it's God's grace that does the saving. How do you find God's grace today? For by grace are ye saved, through faith, and that not of yourselves. The moment you say faith alone, you've turned faith into works, and you're making it of yourselves. I'm not saved by my faith. My faith is what I'm justified by. Well, you know what justified means? It means how you found God's grace. Did you find God's grace the way he said you're supposed to find his grace? Through faith. In this book... This, and, the, and the repentance and the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross, confessing both in prayer and asking God to save you. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is a gift of God. It is a gift. And pa Paul says that's a free gift. But when you get people that start saying, I don't mean to go off this too much again, like we did in the first study, but when you got people that, say free grace and you say well chapter and verse well it's not technically in there but it's technically there but it's not technically you're dealing with someone who's not girding up their loins with truth when they prefer to say things the world's way if they said it's a free gift I'd say yes the Bible says it's a free gift but it's God's grace that saves how do you find that grace through faith faith and repentance faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross uh, a fee, uh, was it 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, how, how Christ died for our sins, how he died, and for our sins, there's your repentance. You don't just come to him saying, I don't care, I love my sin, I have no problem with my sin, but, I want, but you have to save me, but you have to save me, I love my sin, I love my way of life. I don't, I'm not broken, I don't know what you're talking about, I'm not broken. A, I'm not broken like there's something wrong with me, but they're not in a broken state. The Bible says, God saveth such that of a contrite spirit, no, God is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart, and saveth such that be of a contrite spirit. What's their attitude towards this book? And I, we did this study, and I got some slack for it from, of course, the easy believism that loved to mess with this book and loved to change this book left and right. But bottom line, brothers and sisters, if you're girding up your loins, when I first got saved and came to the knowledge of the truth, I couldn't get enough of the truth. I was learning all kinds of doctrines, comparing Scripture with Scripture with Scripture. I learned the Gospel first. 
Then I started learning doctrines that I was never taught in these Bible buildings under these Bible perversions. I started learning what dispensational teaching is, which is unlocks this book greatly and helps you to understand this book. Instruction in righteousness. I was taught the three ways to study the Word of God is word studies, subject studies, expository studies. Okay? There's preaching the Word and there's teaching the Word. Okay? We do Bible studies where it's turn here, turn there, turn here, turn there. Then we do some preaching sometimes where I'm quoting scriptures on the spot. Um, you know, you preach the Word. You teach the Word. You live the Word. But it was the Bible version issue. It's like, okay, this is God's perfect written Word, and I had to come to the point where this is God's perfect written Word, and now it's time to start girding up my loins. I need to start studying it. I need to know what faith I'm supposed to be standing in. I need to know how I'm supposed to live my life. That's when we learned that uh, to be in Christ Jesus, what does it mean to be in Christ Jesus? If this isn't taught much in the Bible buildings at all. What does it mean to be in Christ Jesus? Oh, it means you're saved. It just means you're... No. The Bible says... Uh, who has made unto us uh, wisdom. The beginning of wisdom is fearing the Lord. The end of wisdom, now that you, the beginning of wisdom is fearing the Lord. The middle of wisdom is you're seeking God's truth, God's way, God's word. The end of wisdom is keeping his commandments. Now that you've got God's word, you hide it in your heart and you live it. And the first command we're given is obey the gospel. The first command we're given in this time period, the time of the Gentiles, not church age, Gentiles, time of the Gentiles, meaning salvation went out to the world. It's no longer of the Jews. When Jesus was there preaching the kingdom of heaven, salvation was of the Jews. Now salvation has gone out to the world. Anybody can get saved. But it's called the time of the Gentiles. Okay. We're in the time of the Gentiles. This book, Brother Sister Christ, are you girding up your loins with this book? Starting your day with this book? Ending your day with this book? Living this book? Hiding your heart? Studying it? Rightly dividing it? That's where dispensation comes in. Rightly dividing it. Right. Now, you can always tell people that aren't girding up their loins with their attitude towards this book. The Bible perversionists, they're not putting on... The, uh, the first step is girding up your loins. Why? Because this will tell you how to get saved. This will tell you how to live a life of Christ. This tells you about all the pieces of the armor of God, which we're going through right now. It, it's, it's not a coincidence that it started with girding up your loins. And you know what pe keeps people from girding up your loins? We already said the verse. Um, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. We talked about it. Sin. Sin gets in the way and keeps you from girding up your loins, keeps you from studying this book, keeps you from reading this book. Lust of the flesh, worldliness, getting distracted by the world and what's going on in the world, it keeps you from reading this book and studying this book. The enemy comes in and starts whispering things in your ear that you want to hear, offering you things of the world, offering you lust of the flesh, offering you things of the world, but all you got to do is stop girding up your loins. Stop girding up your loins. So, brother says Christ, that first piece, girding up your loins, it's studying the Word of God and hiding it in your heart and living it. Your love for the Scriptures as they are. You can always tell some of the people that are false converts when they love, love to add to and subtract from the Word of God as they see fit. And brothers and sisters in Christ, some of you, some of you, have stopped girding up your loins because you too are starting to fall into the trap of, yea, hath God said, a better rendering would be. We got a whole recent video on this, okay? Uh, indoctrinated with, yea, hath God said. Are you indoctrinated with, yea, hath God said? I was. I still am sometimes. Not purposely doing it. I'm just, there's times where brethren are still catching me saying things, and I'm like, did I really say that? But it's, it's got to be in here. I've heard it before. But the Bible says, be careful that you're not spoiled by philosophy and vain deceit after the traditions of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. If someone's after Christ, it's all about his word. Jesus said, if a man love me, he will keep my words. If you love me, keep my commandments. Are you after Christ? What gets in the way? The world, the flesh. Stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness. We've talked about this too before, brothers and Christ. Breastplate of righteousness. People think, well, that just means I'm saved. That just means I... it's not talking about the righteousness at salvation. 
where Jesus' righteousness is imputed to you, I believe it's talking about now you're supposed to live right in God's eyes because now you are an ambassador for Jesus Christ. We've talked about this before. You put on a uniform. You're, I was in the military. Pants are pants. The rest of the uniform is just the uniform. But the main part of the uniform that, that showed the people, anybody that looked at your uniform, that showed who you are, who you serve, and who you're a part of. Got my name tag right here. I got the base that I'm a part of. I got the branch of service that I'm a part of over here. And then I'm part of the U.S. You know, you got all these things say when we put on the breastplate of righteousness, that's us putting Jesus on, saying, okay, I represent Jesus Christ to this lost world. Remember, Jesus is the light of the world. And it tells us to put on the armor of light. And then two verses down, if you've watched part one, it said that you're to put on Jesus Christ. Wait, it said put on the, the armor of light, and then it said put on Jesus Christ. When you put on that breastplate of righteousness, you now represent Jesus Christ to this lost world. And Jesus said, this is the condemnation, that light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. Neither cometh they to the light, lest their deeds should be reproved. When you put on that breastplate of righteousness, one of the biggest things you're doing is you're sanctifying yourself. Remember we told you? We're not supposed to walk in darkness, but put on the armor of light. What prevents us from putting on the armor of light? Sin and wickedness, the lust of the flesh. We're supposed to clean up our lives so we can put on that armor and be a light to this dark world. Now, you wouldn't know what the, dark, the lost world's going to do when they see you actually put on that armor of righteousness. You're living right in God's eyes today. You're living God's way. Oh, that man doesn't smoke anymore. He's a goody little two-shoes. He doesn't drink anymore. He doesn't cuss anymore. He doesn't, like, he doesn't hoot and holler at the women like we do anymore. He doesn't do this. Oh, he, he prays all the time. He, he's always reading that book all the time. He's always quoting the scriptures. He's always pre trying to preach the gospel to us. He's always trying to be holier than thou. Have you heard that one before? Yes, when you put on the breastplate of righteousness, we are supposed to be holier than the lost world. Remember with Jesus? He was perfect. Now, I'm not saying we can be perfect, but he was perfect. And he was a light to this dark world. And men love darkness rather than light. That's why they hated Jesus. That's why they put him down. Because his light of his good deeds and doing things the right way and standing for truth reflected onto them and showed them how they weren't. And they didn't like it. It's supposed to convict our lives that we live for Jesus Christ when we put on that breastplate of righteousness. It's supposed to convict the lost world. We are to preach against sin. We're supposed to warn about hell. But we're supposed to be a living witness. There's supposed to be a change in your life after you get saved. But why? Because you now belong to God and you're an ambassador for Jesus Christ. I've said this before. You can tarnish the uniform. You can get dirt on the uniform. You have someone who's professing to be saved. He goes out and gets drunk and has a good time on the town all night. And people see that. You can lose your testimony. You can stop being a good light for Jesus Christ. Why? Because when you go to get into sin, that breastplate, think of it like this, brothers and Christ, that breastplate won't let you get into sin. The only way you can get into sin is if you take the breastplate off and say, I'm going to put it over here for a second so I can do this over here. What gets you to take off the armor of God after you put it on? Sin and wickedness. Worldliness. Cares of this world. The enemy comes in and whispers in your ears and deceives you into taking off the armor for whatever reason. Brothers and Christ, we're supposed to have the breastplate of righteousness on. It's us representing Jesus Christ with the life that we're living. Remember looking, we're going to get into looking for that blessed hope, but it's the life that you're living. You know what leads people to Christ the most? is the life that you're living. Today you can create a lot of false converts with just your words. Now, understand the Bible says, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. We're supposed to preach God's word, but we're also supposed to live it. I remember a preacher once telling me that he had someone, he went to witness to somebody, and the person asked him, do you drink? Do you smoke? Do you gamble? And he said no to all three, and he says, okay, I'm willing to listen to you. And he had a feeling that if he said yes to any of them, that guy wouldn't have listened to him, and rightly so. Because you're supposed to be a living witness. God saved me. 
We are supposed to be holier than the lost world. We are supposed to be working hard at not sinning and living right. And every time we fail, I've talked this, it's not about living sinlessly perfect. I still fail. I still sin from time to time. But what do we do? We feel bad about it. We have to repent. We have to forsake. And we have to get our heart back right with the Lord. We've got to make sure that breastplate's back on. Oh, did I drop it? Did I take it off? Somehow I took it off? I need to put it back on. A man must deny, if any man come after me, he must deny himself, pick up his cross daily, and follow me. Brothers this is Christ, this whole, when we're going through the girding the loins, and we're going to go through the whole piece of armor, you need to make sure you're putting it on daily. You need to make sure it's still on daily. I'll say it like that too. You need, like I said, put it on, don't take it off. But every day you need to make sure you start your day with the Word of God and prayer and say, Lord, do I have the whole armor of God? Just go through the, all the armors of God real quick. Okay, do I have all these on? Thank you, Lord. Let's get this day, let's get this day going. The breastplate of righteousness will get you to take it off. Sin, the world, Satan comes along and whispers at you and says, Oh, you don't really need that breastplate on. You don't really, you know, you can compromise to win the world. You can compromise the gospel to see more people get saved. You can comp compromise the word of God so you can do your Babel building and, and put on your show and entertainment. You can compromise the word of God on your YouTube channel and turn it into a YouTube business and, and so on and make more money and everything. You compromise to make more money. And what next thing you know, you're not wearing any of the pieces of the armor of God. Brothers of Christ, the world should see Jesus Christ in us by the life you're living, not your words. We've gotten so stuck. I know I'm going off on this a little bit for long, too long, Brothers of Christ, but we've gotten so stuck on people's words. But their deeds need to back up their words. They need to stop being all talk, brother. We need to stop being all talk and we need to be walk. Our works, the lives that we live, should back up the words we say. And I'm finding out in the body of Christ, and this is for everybody, it's not always so. Here's the next piece of the armor. And your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. I said that when you put on that breastplate, you become an ambassador for Jesus Christ. When you put on those shoes, you're now part of the ministry of reconciliation. And the number one thing is being a living witness. Not a verbal witness, a living witness. People should look at you and go, like people that used to know you, and I know what Jesus said, uh, uh, what is it, a prophet is without honor save in his own country. You're, it's hard to lead your family to Christ that knew you as a lost man, or friends that knew you as a lost man. But one thing that they should see in you is saying, hey, that's not the same man. I don't know what's wrong. What's, what's, I don't know what's wrong with him. You know, they say that something's wrong with him. Oh, he maybe he joined in a cult or something. But they look at you and go, "That's not the same man." And I'm telling you, the world's the, the, when you put on the whole armor of God. Space, since we're talking about being a living witness, Jesus' light's going to shine through you and shine on them, and they're going to see how wicked and sinful they are because you're trying to live right because you belong to Jesus Christ. The light in you is shining on their sin and their wickedness. And through you telling them, so your words come next, but your actions, your life shows that, hey, something's not right with them. Something's right with you, but something's not right with them. And they look at you and go, I either want what he has, or they get offended. This is the condemnation that light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Neither cometh they to the light. They don't want to be around you. Lest their deeds should be reproved. They love their sin. They love their wickedness. They love their worldliness. They don't want to be around you. Or they get convicted. They get broken. God does the breaking, not us. We just preach the truth and the Holy Spirit goes out and reproves the world of sin. We preach the truth. You don't bully someone into salvation. You don't guilt trip someone into salvation. And you don't bribe someone into salvation. Okay, bribing. You can get all these rewards in heaven. Just give your life to Jesus Christ. I didn't give my life to Jesus Christ. I didn't even know about the rewards in heaven until after I got saved. Praise God. It wasn't until after I got saved that God really started showing me the judgment seat of Christ and how the reason we're still down here is we're supposed to be a living witness, a verbal witness, and we're supposed to be earning rewards at the judgment seat of Christ, how we're going to spend eternity with our Savior. 
We're supposed to be focused on that blessed hope and being caught up in the judgment seat of Christ go hand in hand. We're supposed to have our eyes on that judgment seat of Christ with the life that we're living. But I didn't know that until after I got saved. I didn't get saved so I could get more rewards in heaven. I got saved because I didn't want to go to hell. And I needed to get saved. And only Jesus Christ could save me. I had to come to him broken in repentance. Believing in the finished work of Jesus Christ. I, for almost my life, brothers and sisters Christ, I knew the gospel. I knew about Jesus Christ, how, how he died. And they saved for the sins of the world and everything. I knew all this. I had head knowledge. But it never made it down here. Why? Because I was never taught what true biblical repentance is. Coming to God broken, having sorrow in your heart for your personal sins. Paul said, O wretched man that I am. He said, I am the chiefest of sinners. When you have the Pharisees and the publican, publican smote upon his breast and said, God be merciful to me, a sinner. But I was part of this false religion out there that just said, oh, you're a sinner, we're a sinner, we're all sinners. But I was never taught what true biblical repentance was. And when I was shown it, I finally came broken and God goes, you know what? You're ready for the truth. And he showed me the truth. I fell on my knees and, I got, and God saved me. I fell on my knees, confessed both my repentance and my belief in the finished work of Jesus Christ that's now down here, not up here, but down here. Confess both in prayer and ask God to save me. Brothers and Christ, you hopefully have had that same experience, the changed life. That's what it means by putting on the feet shod with the preparation of peace. You're a living witness first and a verbal witness second. Because the living witness used to be, now everyone's all talk, all talk and no walk hardly, but it used to be someone saw something in you and they either didn't like it and they'd go the other way. When they saw you coming, they'd go the other way. Or they saw something in you and be like, he's got something. You know what? I kind of want what he has. I talked to this story before about a fire coming through here. And I had to evacuate and I went down to Gold Beach and stayed at the high, I think it was a high school or grade school gym. I can't remember what, it was a school, but it's a gym. And I was on a cot there for at least a week. And I had my Bible open and because I had highlighted everything, I was doing Bible studies. It just seems like the only type of people who are supposed to highlight are pastors. And they thought I was a pastor. Because only people who highlight the really study this book is pastors. No, we're all supposed to study this book. That's girding up your loins. But everyone was scared of losing everything. If I lose everything, it's the end of the world. It's, 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 I'm nothing. It's, it's the end. And yet I was calm and peaceful and had joy. I was singing some hymns. I was reading the Bible. I was going through some Bible studies at the time. And I got interviewed by the local guy. I don't think I ever got put on. But the local guy, he's asking me, he's like, why aren't you as scared as everyone else is? And I said, because I know where I'm going to go when I die. This is nothing. It's eternity that matters. And if God takes this, he's the one that gave it to me. If he wants to take it, he can take it. But I know where I'm going to go when I die. See, people look at that and the, Paul says, be ready to give an answer of the hope. Not Paul, Peter. Be ready to give an answer of the hope that is in you. That blessed hope. I know where I'm going to go when I die. They see that hope in you. They see that joy in you. They see that the world could be falling apart. Some people, brother, like I said, what keeps you from shining your feet with the preparation of peace? You get distracted by the world. Oh, the one world religion, the one world economy, the, the worldwide economic collapse. The BRICS is destroying the U.S. dollar. Are we going to go into World War III? Are we going to do that? Blah, 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 blah. What is that? Do? Those are distractions. We're supposed to be ready to give an answer of the hope that is in us. No matter what's going on in this wicked world, I know where I'm going to go when I die. And I'm going to stay here and be a living witness and a verbal witness. But a living witness first, a verbal witness second. They look at you and go, hey, he's got something I want. He's got a peace that I don't have. I know how to have fun. Flesh is fun. Fun is flesh. But I really don't know what joy is. I've been lied to because today all these things, peace, joy, they're deceived into thinking they have peace when they don't. They're deceived into thinking they have joy when it's just flesh fun. They're just their flesh getting riled up. It's not real joy. Happiness. They think gain, gaining the world. Remember the Bible says, I know this is for the time of Jacob's trouble, 
But what shall it uh, profit a man if he should gain the whole world and lose his own soul? They think gaining the world is happiness. But why are these rich people so miserable? They look at you, brothers and sisters Christ, and they see something in you that they want. And this whole push of this easy believism is so there is no changed life. You don't have to be, a, there is no living witness. You can just be all talk. You just all talk. The Bible says we're supposed to put on the breastplate or the feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Real quick, one more thing. When you go to actually verbally witness, you need to do it peacefully. And meekness instructing those that oppose themselves. You have to be gentle unto all men. We're not supposed to be preaching the gospel out of pride, bitterness. We're not supposed to do it in anger. We're not supposed to do it with hate. Remember it says put on the breastplate of faith and love. Our love for the lost world is we desperately want to see him get saved and born again. And right now, with this whole thing about putting on the armor of God, we read, it says up there, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Right now, there are so many false gospels out there, and the most popular false gospel out there is a repentantless gospel. They turn faith into works, and since you've earned it, you can just take it. You don't ask for it. It's not given to you by God. There is no changed life. You don't have to be a living witness. You can just be verbal. And I can go on and on. And they try to deny this, but their works, it's their works that are being judged. These so-called, I used to be one of these faith alone, easy believers. And you look at the life I was living, I was not saved. I was not a new creature in Christ Jesus. I looked like the world, act like the world, talk like the world. I was into all kinds of sin and wickedness, which I had no power over. It had power over me. Romans chapter 8, carnally minded and walking after the flesh. The lust of the flesh, the world, they have power over you. How do you, get, how do you get power back? You don't. You come to the cross broken. And God gives you the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit gives you power through His Word to overcome sin and wickedness of this world. All right? Peacefully, brother says Christ, peacefully. And we're fighting against... The enemy that's coming out with all these false gospels that are so appealing to the lost world. You can keep the life that you have and just have a profession of faith. And you can go to heaven. And you know what they hit us up with, brothers of Christ? Oh, you guys are teaching works. No, we're teaching that they're supposed to be evidence of salvation. Paul said it. Prove yourself so many times. Be approved, prove yourself, or be reproved. But you're supposed to prove that you're a Christian. In Christ, you're part of the body of Christ, that you belong to Jesus Christ. You're supposed to prove it with the life that you're living. And they're against it. Living witness. And I can't kick it enough times, Brother Christ. You're supposed to be a living witness for Jesus Christ. How can you tell when people have taken off that, that they've taken off the uh, preparation of the gospel, the feet shod with the preparation of peace? They're starting to look like the world. They're starting to talk like the world again. You're starting to, Paul warned about not resurrecting the old man. You're starting to get into sin. So you take those shoes off and you start blending into the world because you're sinning like the world and you're looking like the world. Worldliness, the cares of this world. You start getting fearful of what's going on in the world so you take the shoes off and you start trying to blend in so you don't you know, cause too much friction that you might not get in trouble. It might save your life. Remember what Jesus said? Whoever shall save his life shall lose it. But whoever shall lose his life for my sake in the Gospels, the same shall save it. Now I believe that's for the time of Jacob's trouble because there's works, you're justified by works, and there's faith on the side. You lose your life if you don't take the mark and you don't worship the beast. But for today, brothers and sisters Christ, some of you start getting worried about what could happen to you in this wicked world. So you start compromising, conforming to the world. The Bible says, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove was that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. When you start conforming to this world, you don't prove was that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You start resurrecting the old man, showing people how you were before you were saved. You start going back to trying to act and look like a lost person. 
Remember Paul saying, Oh foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you? And he's talking about how they came in and got him to turn on the true plan of salvation, but he called them foolish. A fool has said in his heart there is no God. So what is foolish? You're acting like a fool that says there is no God with your actions. You're starting to act like a lost person that doesn't belong to Jesus Christ. Brother says, Christ, do you look with your actions and how you live your life? Does the world look, neighbors look at you and say, hey, that man belongs to Jesus Christ. There's something about that man I don't like. You're going to be a living witness, and then a verbal witness. The living witness is how people are going to come up to you and say, Hey, what is it that you've got that I don't have? And that's when the verbal witness comes in. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. The Gospel, the, the, with the, it talks about how, the, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the Gospel of peace. Amen. We are supposed to preach the Gospel of peace. But we're also supposed to be a living witness. When you put that on, it has to do with both. We need to work hard, brothers. I'm going to kick it again one last time, then we'll move on. Brothers of Christ, we need to make sure that we are not all talk. That we have works, walk, backing up what we're saying. Okay. Now here's verse 16. Above all, taking the shield of faith. Above all? You know what got me saved? faith in this book but the gospel that this says is the right gospel because like I said I came out of false religion I've been told all kinds of gospels when I came to the save, saving grace of God through his perfect written word and faith in his word remember it says it effectually worketh also in you that believe uh, I think it's in the book of James I keep saying Peter said it but it's in the book of James I think it says receive the engrafted word which is able to save your soul we, I've said the verse, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Real faith, not the fake faith, the real faith. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. That's why it says above all, it starts with faith in this book. Is this God's perfect written word? Yes. Okay, now, what's the gospel that it preaches? Repentance towards God, faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, confess both in prayer, and ask God to save you. Obey the gospel. I did that. God saved me. Now it says do this. Now it says do that. And I have to have faith in this, that God knows what he's talking about. Abstain from all appearance of evil. Put no wicked thing before thine eyes. It shall not cleave unto me. Images will cleave to you a lot stronger than words will. Reading books, you usually have to read a book a million times to really get it down, but you watch one Hollywood movie and it gets burned in your brain forever. Well, until we get caught up and get new bodies. And hopefully God burns that stuff out of our, our, our minds. But you understand images. But these are commands of God. You have to have faith that God knows what he's talking about. When God said, hey, the world is what it is. It's going to always be deteriorating. Everything's always going to be getting worse and worse and worse. And God says, you know what? Don't worry about that. Worry about this. Worry about your words. Worry about the life that you're living. Being a living witness and a verbal witness. And if worst case scenario, you have to die for this book, and you have to die for the gospel, the true plan of salvation, then know that it's not in vain. Paul says, know that your work is, is not in vain. Be not weary in well-doing. Having done all to stand. Keep living for the Lord no matter what. And it starts with faith. The shield of faith is above all. If you have the faith, that's what helps you gird up the loins. Usually the first thing that gets taken off, the first thing you put down is your shield. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench the fiery darts of the wicked. We talked about you're supposed to be sober, you're supposed to be vigilant. There's people, your flesh is always going to try to deceive you and say, oh, does the Bible really mean that? Or do you really have to follow the Bible? The lost world comes in and tries to distract you, either with fear, or the Bible talks about, uh, what is it, uh, unlearned questions, avoid, um, strife, they do cause strife, debating. 
and all this stuff where they come in and start getting you to argue and everything when it comes to the Word of God. We're not to argue the Word of God. We're not to debate the Word of God. We're to discuss the Word of God. We're to study the Word of God. We're to exhort each other with the Word of God. We're to correct one another with the Word of God. But don't get into arguments and don't get into debates with the lost world when it comes to this book. It's a spiritually discerned book. You have to have faith in it. And I've said this plenty of times before, Brother Christ, how many times people hit me up today. People don't hardly hit me up today anymore, like trying to question me, not because I don't, because of me, but it's just, I used to get attacked a lot with the truth. I'd stand for the truth and I'd get attacked a lot, but I got to the point where I'd ask them, do you believe that the King James Bible is God's perfect written word? What gospel did you get saved off of? Are you dispensational? Those three questions. And if they get any of those three questions wrong, the only thing I'll talk to them about is the Bible version issue, the true plan of salvation, and dispensational teaching. And until they get that down, there's no point in talking to them about anything else. They need to believe this book. Brother says, Christ, do you believe in this book? I, Be careful, I'm going to hit everybody again, including myself. Every time I, I failed the Lord and started adding to his book and subtracting from his book, Maybe with my words, I believe this is God's book, but with my actions, I was correcting it. Be careful of those who say, I believe this is God's perfect written word. It's perfect from cover to cover. How thou not to his word, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. Okay, turn here, and I'm going to teach you about the, the Trinity. Turn here, and I'm going to teach you about the church age. Turn here, and God says this is the church age, and God says this is the, the rapture, and God said... Be careful of that. With their words, I know brethren who I believe love the Word of God, but with their words and their actions, they kept trying to correct this book. They kept adding to it and subtracting from it. They could say it better than God could say it. Where's the faith that this is God's perfect written Word? It's without error. We need to get back to saying things God's way. We need to get back to doing things God's way. And it starts with faith that God knows what He's saying and then when God tells us this is how we're supposed to live, we trust God, we have faith in God, that this is the way we're supposed to live. Why? Because God said so. Take on the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And take the helmet of salvation. The helmet of salvation. People keep saying, that's just salvation as far as you got saved. You automatically have it on if you got saved and everything. No, you can't. No, you don't. The Bible says... Um, let no man steal thy crown. Crown goes where? On your head. Where does this helmet for salvation go? On your head. And we learn in another passage, it's not just the helmet of salvation, it's a helmet of the hope of salvation. I don't have to hope for eternal salvation. I'm eternally secure now. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know you have eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. Grieve not the Holy Spirit, whereby ye are sealed until the day of redemption. You're sealed. That's not talking about eternal salvation. This helmet is talking about salvation from this life. It's a hope of salvation. Hope? What are we supposed to be looking for every day with the life we're living? That blessed hope? Where the body of Christ gets caught up? The day of Christ? The day of redemption? The body of Christ gets caught up before the time of Jacob's trouble? And then the judgment seat of Christ happens? That blessed hope? That's what we're supposed to be looking for. Remember, brothers of Christ, I was taught this and I still believe this to this day. When you're looking for that blessed hope, you have to have these two things in mind. If Jesus Christ came back tomorrow, what do you need to get done for him today? What sanctification still needs to get done? You're an ambassador for Jesus Christ. What work do you need to get done to be a better light to this dark world? The ministry of reconciliation. Do you fear God and are you doing your best to keep his commandments? And where you're failing, are you trying to repent and get your heart right with God immediately? Because we can get caught up at any moment. If Jesus Christ came back tomorrow, what do you need to get done for him today? That's the first thing you need to have on your heart, brothers and sisters Christ. So you're striving to make sure you have the whole armor of God on and you're living for Jesus Christ every day. The second mindset is this. Every once in a while, it's, it's a kick in the bri britches, brother says Christ, a kick in the butt to get us moving. If Jesus Christ came back today, are you ready? 
Now, this isn't easy for me to say because I know some brethren that I love and care about, but they've turned their back on looking present tense for that blessed hope. I got corrected when I said um, the imminent return of Jesus Christ. Chapter verse where it says imminent return. Well, you're right, it doesn't. But it says looking present tense for that blessed hope. And we're supposed to be living every day till the, the day of Christ. Looking for the day of Christ to happen. We don't know when it's going to happen. It could happen any day, and that's how we're supposed to live. If it happened tomorrow, what do we need to get done for him today? If it happened today, are we ready? When Paul was looking for it every day with the life he's living, and then he got told, hey, tomorrow we're going to behead you, he sat there and said, I finished my course. I fought the good fight. I finished my course. Now, there's brethren that will try to say that, that I believe are just lying through their teeth. To me, I still ask myself that every day. Could I say what Paul said? If I can't, I need to get back to work. If I can, praise God. And I've told you, Brothers Christ, there's days where I can say it and mean it. Then there's days where I look at my life and said, Hey, I started getting laxed. I started taking this armor, piece of armor off. I started, I started failing you here, Lord. And I, started, I need to get this back together the way it was when I was in a standing position and said, I'm ready for you. I've had those days, days I'm ready for Jesus Christ to come back, days I'm like, oh Lord, if you came back now, I'm not ready. That's what that helmet is, is to remind you to always look for Jesus Christ. I've always said, I said this in the study that we did for just the helmet. Most helmets have covers on both sides, and one thing that comes down to protect the nose, but all you can see is through the eyes, and your vision's like this, so you have to look with your head if I turn my head over here, that's what I, my whole body tends to go. I don't know if you've driven before, but I, I, get, I didn't drive for nine years because of a seizure disorder. Got my license back, but anytime I look too much to the right, like I'm looking at the ocean, I'll start steering that direction a little bit. And I've got to, oh, I got to stay on the road, keep my eyes on the road. Why? Because your body naturally goes where you're looking. It naturally goes that direction. And that helmet for a hope of salvation, when it's put on, it means that you're looking for Jesus Christ. When you turn over and look at the world, you start going the way of the world. If you turn around and start looking at your flesh, you start going the way of your flesh. You take that helmet off, and you start looking at the world, you start going the way of the world. You start looking at the flesh, you go in the way of the flesh. You start looking at Satan and his enemies and what they're whispering at you. You're supposed to be sober, you're supposed to be vigilant, and we're supposed to fight against false the, the enemy by preaching the truth and standing for the truth. But that helmet for a hope of salvation comes on. You're looking for Jesus Christ every day. What gets you to take off that helmet? Lust of the flesh. Because that's a match, and that helmet comes on, all you can see is Jesus Christ. If you start getting into sin and wickedness, you had to take off that helmet to get into that sin and wickedness. You start getting fearful of the world, or you start getting into loving the world more than you love Jesus Christ and the things of the world, like hell days, how you want to live your life. Hollywood movies, TV shows, video games. I only throw this stuff out here because I've lost fellowship with brethren who have chosen the world over the Word of God. They've taken that helmet off for a hope of salvation. Some of them even turn their back. There is no imminent return of Jesus Christ. He's not, and they put it off. He's not coming for another five years. Yet the Bible says we're to love His appearing, and we've got a crown. Let no man steal thy crown. And that crown is for looking for that blessed hope and believing in it by looking for it with the life that we're living. And you got brethren that, have that they, they let someone steal their crown. They've taken off that helmet for a hope of salvation. They're so distracted by the world. And they're starting to love things of the world. I've had people turn their back on me, broke fellowship with me, over Hollywood movies, TV shows, video games, satanic style music, alcohol, holidays, uh, priorities where their wives, their husbands came first. Their children came first. The way they want to live their life comes first before the way God wants you to live your life. Covetousness, idolatry. What happened? They took off their helmet for a hope of salvation. And when it does come, it's going to catch them off guard. They're not going to be ready. They're going to be one of those people where their life is a complete mess when God calls them home. I don't mean to go into this too much, but I, I can't stand that preaching that some of the brethren, I hope they're saved, but they might not all be brethren, but in the Bible building system, you see it in the Bible building system, they claim to be King James Bible believers, but they'll teach studies that say that what will solve all your problems today is the catching away of the body of Christ. 
And I'm like, it might get you away from your problems down here, but if you have tons of problems down here because you're not living a life of Christ, because you don't have the full armor of God on, and you keep making a mess, you're going to have to answer for it at the judgment seat of Christ. So it doesn't solve you from this problem. It creates an even bigger problem for you up there. These, people, these preachers should be teaching, get your eyes back on Jesus Christ. Get that whole armor of God on. Get your heart right with the Lord. And let the Lord clean your life back up again. Some of you, he did it at salvation. And over time, you start resurrecting the old man. You start getting messed up in the lust of the flesh. You start getting messed up in the world. And it's like you got to turn, you turn back to God so he can clean up your life all over again. He cleaned it up once, and now you've dirtied it. Remember, you soiled the uniform. You can't, uh, if you wallow in the mud, you don't got the uniform on. We don't walk in darkness, but put on the armor of light. It's contrary one that you can't walk in darkness and have the armor of light on. They're contrary one to the other. You can't have light and darkness at the same time. And take the helmet of salvation. Are, you, are your eyes on Jesus Christ? Or your eyes on America and, and getting caught up in the politics of the elections. I, don't get me wrong, I watch the news. I look at the news and I see what's going on in Europe. Believe it or not, a lot of Europe is rioting. Uh, China, I've heard that there's riots in China. Basically, there's upheaval everywhere. And everyone's like, elections here, elections there. Everyone, the world, I know about World War II coming in. I know what's going on in Israel and what they're going through right now. I understand that we could go through a civil war. I understand the economic collapse and everything. But you know what? It doesn't phase me. Why? Because my eyes are on Jesus Christ. If Jesus wants this stuff to happen, it'll happen. If he doesn't want this stuff to happen, it won't happen. God's in charge. And no matter what we go down through here, down, no matter what we go through down here, it's for God's glory. And some of you brothers says Christ, and I pray I never do, but You've forgotten that. You start whining and complaining. You start being fearful. You've forgotten to give God glory in all things and to give Him thanks in all things. And no matter how hard it gets down here, we're to give God glory. We're here for His glory. We're here to be a light to this dark world. And the darker this world gets, the better our light can shine. I'm talking about how bad it gets out there. If, if we go through a civil war, financial collapse and everything, I'm like, Lord, it'll be tough for me. I'm not saying I, I'm going to love it. I'm not putting on a show. I'm a little fearful, but my number one fear is the Lord. But I look at this and go, Lord, if we hit really hard, hard times, that might open the doors for the gospel a lot more. Because when people are going through hard times and they're dirt poor and are broken and they don't know whether they're going to get by tomorrow, they don't know what tomorrow is, they don't know what about anything about eternity, what's this life, it starts opening doors for witnessing when America is just mostly rich and everyone has money, today they whine and complain. I don't want to go into it too much, but today they whine and complain if they don't get to go out to eat at least two or three times a week. Dirt poor is not knowing whether you can maybe get one or two meals a week. That's when you start whining and complaining. But in America, they'll just complain. They got three meals a day and some snacks. But if they don't get to go out to eat, they don't get to go to that movie, that Hollywood movie, if they don't get to go out and buy these toys and this stuff, we're just so dirt poor here in America. Our, our economy is just so so far, fallen far, and it, it's garbage. Maybe if they were actually dirt poor instead of pretending to be dirt poor, maybe they'd be more open to the gospel. Brothers says Christ, don't get distracted by this wicked world. Stay focused. And here's another part. And the sword of the Spirit... Which is, the sword, which is the word of God. We talked about it. You gird up your loins with it. You keep that sword sharp. That's why you stay in the word of God every day. Because if I didn't, I'd start forgetting scriptures. I'd start, I'd start being, what's that one verse? Uh, I haven't read the Bible. When was the last time I read the Bible? Oh, a week ago, a month ago, six months ago. I'm not talking about me. I'm using it as an example. There's times where I did put this book down in my early life. I got hardcore, got really into it, started cleaning up some of my life. And then I started going back into Hollywood movies and video games and stuff like that. And anytime I started getting back into the world and worldliness, this book would get put down and start gathering dust. And I'd have to come back and relearn things. you got to keep, this is a sword, you got to keep it sharp. you got to keep studying it to keep it fresh in your hearts. Why do we go over the... I love it. I love going over the same studies. Not like every second of every day, just one study. There's so much to learn from this book. You can go six months 
and then restart the six months over again, and still there's extra studies you've never gone through that you learn new studies. This is just so much this book, but my point is, is I have no problem if I did once a month, and I, I know the Bible doesn't say eternal security, it says we're sealed until the day of redemption. We can know we have eternal life. But that teaching that we're sealed until the day of redemption, I could watch, listen to that teaching once a month, once a week, and it wouldn't faze me. I love the Word of God. It, it keeps it fresh in my heart. You watch one study once, you don't stop and go, oh, I'm good. I watched it once. I'm good. No, you keep watching it every so often. Why? Because you've got to keep it fresh in your heart. You've got to keep that sword sharp. It'll get dull after a while. You've got to keep it sharp. And it's two-edged. It cuts both ways. It cuts you first before it cuts the world. Before it cuts your brother and sister, brother and sister Christ. You say, why would you want to cut them? The Bible says we're supposed to exhort each other and we're supposed to correct each other through the Word of God. But judgment must first begin at the house of God. Judgment starts here. This book judges me first. I need to prove myself by making sure I have the whole armor of God on that I'm actually in Christ, Christian. We did all those four things, wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, redemption. This book judges me first. And once I get judged and I get my heart right with the world, then it can, I can judge a brother or sister in Christ that doesn't line up with this book. Then I can judge the lost world by showing them how much of a wicked sinner they are. First, by the life I'm living, it reflects how bad they are. Then my words, quoting the scriptures, Thou shalt not do this. This is a sin. Drunkenness is a sin. Fornication is a sin. Adultery is a sin. Drunkenness is a sin. I think I said drunkenness, but you know, thou, thou shalt not bear false witness. Abstain. You know, I could, you go through the sins, and now you can start judging them through this book. And when we judge the lost world, it's not because we want to seek their destruction. We want them to know that, hey, they're sinners. And sin, there's a cost to sin. Hell. And sin separates you from God. And the only way to get saved is to come to Him broken in repentance and believing in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross that happens here. Notice how it happens here in the heart. Then you confess both in prayer. Then you ask God to save you. But this judges us first before it judges the world. Anybody outside of you it judges you first, then the people around you, whether they be saved or lost. But you got to keep it sharp. You got to stay in the Word night and day. Bible, Paul, and Psalms. King David's talking about this. Thy servant lo loves thy laws, and he meditates on them night and day. He meditates on them night. Why? Look at the Old Testament. Look at the Jews. The different generations. One generation did right by God. Then you go through two or three generations that didn't do right by God, and then one generation would find God's Word and say, "Okay, we're going back to doing things God's way." But what got them to turn from God? They didn't stay in His Word. Now, I'm not talking about they had a Bible back then, but they had the Old Testament Scriptures, the scrolls. If you read the story, there was a king. They were re repairing the temple, and they found the scrolls of Moses where he said, if you don't do these things, this wickedness will happen to you. And they got their heart right with God because they got back in God's Word. When you stray from God's Word, you fail. You've got to keep God's Word fresh in your heart. You gotta be staying in it. I mean, people will say, well, that's the whole armor of God. Yes, that's the armor. Now that you have the armor of God, there's, t there's things you're supposed to do. Verse 18. Praying, uh, Ephesians 2, uh, 6, 18. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. Pray without ceasing. Which, well, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and abradeth not, and it shall be given unto him. May, let your request be made known unto God. Our prayer life starts at salvation, before God even saves us. When we call, when we confess both our prayer, Lord, Lord, I'm a dirty, rotten, filthy, low-down, no-good sinner on my way to hell, and I deserve to go to hell for sinning against you, Lord. I'm so sorry. I regret ever sinning against you. Now I'm in this mess, and I believe. And the only way out of this mess mess is the, the blood of your son I believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross Lord please save me your prayer life starts before God saves you but remember what, what King David said if I hold iniquity in my heart my, uh, my if I hold iniquity in my heart God will not hear me 
What keeps God from hearing the sinner's plea if they're holding iniquity in their heart? And that's why I always say, when you throw your iniquity at the foot of the cross, brothers and Christ, we all have testimonies. We threw our iniquity at the foot of the cross. I said, look, Lord, this is how wicked I am. I'm not sugarcoating it. I'm not holding anything back. This is my iniquity. I'm throwing it at the foot of the cross. I'm not, it's not sanctification. It's just saying, this is who I am, and I'm sorry for it. And I'm not holding back. I'm not holding anything in my heart. If you hold iniquity in your heart, even as a saved sinner, if you hold iniquity in your heart, God will not hear you. If you start getting into covetousness hardcore, idolatry hardcore, lust of the flesh hardcore, your prayers will go unanswered. You have to have your heart right with God. You have to have the whole armor of God on. When you start taking off the armor pieces because of lust of the flesh, because of worldliness, and being distracted by the world and what's going on in the world, or by the enemy, you'll start realizing your prayer, it seems like your prayers are going unanswered. They are, if you're holding iniquity in your heart. It's not saying you have to be sinlessly perfect. You can be sin. I failed the Lord in sin, and I fall on my knees. You look at King David, a man who committed adultery, and then had a man murdered so he could have his wife. That's sin. But why did God hear his prayers afterwards? Because he humbled himself and threw his iniquities on the altar. He said, I'm sorry, Lord, I was wrong. When you have someone come to him saying, I believe in your son, but I didn't really do anything that wrong. I'm not that bad. And yeah, I might be a sinner, but you know, like that Pharisee and the Sadducees, the Pharisees, I'm not like other men are, like this man or this publican. And you start going off and you have the attitude where I'm not that bad. That means you're still holding something back. You're still holding sin in your heart. God will not hear your prayers. But your prayer life starts at salvation. And it continues. And what gets in the way of your prayer life? Lust of the flesh. Sin. The, another word for it in the Bible is iniquity. It's talking about sin. Lust of the flesh. You're not supposed to uh, make provisions for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Are we to sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How are we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Why? Because you want a strong prayer life with the Lord. Now I've said this before. When If you have a strong prayer life with the Lord because you're living right, you're not holding iniquity in your heart, you might fail him from time to time, but you're broken. And you come to him broken and saying, I shouldn't have done that, Lord. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. You're not holding it in your heart. You'll get three answers. Yes. No. Not right now. In my experience, that's the three. You, God will always answer your prayers if you're not. There's a false teaching out there. Thank God for unanswered prayers. No, thank God for answered prayers. Because if you don't have, if you, if you have unanswered prayers, it's because you're holding iniquity in your heart. But God will say yes. He'll say no. He'll say not right now. Now, I'm not saying he answers you right on the spot. It might take a little bit before he answers you. But you always get an answer. When your heart's right with the Lord. It just not it just might not be the answer you like. I want it to be yes, but it's it's no. Well, maybe maybe he's saying not right now. No, he's saying no. <laughs> I'm talking about my life. There's times where I'm like, are you sure it's no? Are you sure it's not not right now? But brothers to Christ, we're supposed to pray with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit and watching. Thereunto, with all perseverance and supplication for the saints, we're supposed to get, keep an eye out for each other. Remember, be sober, be vigilant, for your adversary, the devil, going around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. When you see a brother in Christ take off a piece of the armor, when you see a brother in Christ or sister in Christ that's struggling with the flesh or the world and they've fallen, you're to do your. You're supposed to keep an eye out for that, so you can get over there with the word of God to pick him back up. Quickly, we got to get you back up. Why? Because Satan's going around like a roaring lion, seeking who may, he may devour. Get that armor back on. Get your heart right with the Lord. We're supposed to be helping out one another. We're supposed to be there for one another, helping them out physically and spiritually. Sometimes people can, a brethren can fall on hard times, and those hard times, like I said, the world, distracted by the world, hard times can try to motivate you to take off the whole armor of God. You're supposed to be there for the brethren. Ever watchful in your own life and your walk with the Lord and be in there to help other brethren with their walk with the Lord. Ever watchful of the enemy. 
Okay? When you're a shepherd, especially when you're a shepherd over a sheep, you're supposed to be ever watchful for the enemy. You're supposed to be ever watchful for brethren who fall away and start hurting the brethren. And here's this one, verse 19. For me that utterance may be given unto me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. This is for Paul. Now we preach the gospel that was revealed to Paul. Brothers of Christ, are you, trying, are you praying that God opens the doors to you to witness? I always pray, Lord, let me lead someone to Christ face to face, in person. Give me the courage to say the right things, quoting your scriptures, say the right things, and be able to lead someone to Christ face to face. Give me the courage to leave gospel tracts places. Give me the courage that when the doors open, to hand out gospel tracts. You know, I pray this not just for me, but I pray it for you, brothers of Christ. How about this? Are you praying for men in ministry? That the Lord helps them stay true to this book and not become part of the falling away. That they're preaching the gospel with boldness, not out of pride, not out of bitterness, not for filthy lucre's sake, not because it's a money-making business, but they're preaching the word and preaching the gospel. Are you praying for them? And everybody says, like, pray for them. He says, for which I am an ambassador in bonds. That's because he's, remember he said, I'm a, a prisoner of Jesus Christ. He's under house arrest. He's a prisoner. He's an ambassador. In We're ambassadors, brother, says Christ. We need to be praying that we can lead people to Christ. Get as many people saved before we get caught up, whether it's in life or in death. Remember, you can get caught up in death. You might not live to see the catching away, but we're to live every day as if it could happen tomorrow. If it could happen today. Remember the two types of way to look at it. To help motivate you to live for Jesus Christ. You're an ambassador. He says, for which I'm an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. There's a difference between speaking boldly and being arrogant. Speaking boldly and being a flat out jerk. I've seen a lot of these street preachers where they're, all they're doing is they're causing contentions. They're trying to cause confrontation. They're trying to start a fight. We're not supposed to be doing that. You can be bold and preach the truth boldly, but we're supposed to be gentle unto all men. We're supposed to have the feet shod with the preparation of peace and in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves. Now, Brother Jesus Christ, do you have on the whole armor of God? Prove yourself. Prove that you have it all on. Okay? Real quick. We're going to go over everything. We're going to wrap this up with a summary. We're going to go over it. Girt about with truth. What's your attitude towards this book? Are you studying this book, the King James Bible? 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that, not, that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Unto all good works. Are you girding about your loins about with truth? Armor of righteousness, 2 Corinthians 6, 7 says, By the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness, on the right hand and on the left. Are you an ambassador for Jesus Christ? When people look at you, do they see Jesus Christ, that holiness, that sanctification, that love of the truth, that love you have for your brothers and sisters in Christ? Feet shod, Romans 10, 15 says, And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Is your feet shod with the preparation of peace? Or do you seem to cause trouble a lot with arguing and debating and, and back, uh, uh, backbiting and whispering, name calling, mocking? Are you trying to promote peace? Or are you trying to cause conflict? The Bible talks about how be watch out for the brethren who sow division, people who like to sow division. That some of them might be saved. So I believe a lot of false converts are coming in and sowing division in the body of Christ. They're causing a lot of trouble because they're getting brethren to go against this book. They're getting brethren to fight amongst themselves. The shield of faith, Hebrew 11 and 6 says, But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Helmet of salvation, 1 Thessalonians 5, 8. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. Hope, it's something you're looking for. 
It's not talking about present tense salvation, like eternally. I'm talking about eternal salvation. It's talking about salvation in this life. That's why Paul talks about um, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. By the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Uh, you've got you got a judgment seat coming. You got to stand before Jesus Christ to be judged as a saved sinner, and that's a fearful thing. Are you ready? Sword of the Spirit, Hebrews 4.12 says, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the divining asunder of soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrows, and is discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. What are you holding in your heart? Are you holding iniquity in your heart so God can't hear you? Are you holding thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee? What are you hiding in your heart, brothers and sisters? Praying, Philippians 4, 6 says, Be careful in nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your request be made known unto God. Pray without ceasing. Do you have a strong prayer life? Watching thereunto, 1 Peter 5, 8 says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith. Remember, above all, taking on the shield of faith. Whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in you, accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. Brothers says Christ, you say, well, I'm having a hard time keeping the armor of God on. You're not the only one. You're not the only one. Now, if you give me just a second, brothers says Christ, we might run out of power. So I'm going to, we're going to sing a sim after, hymn after this, but I want to end this with grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all and my love for you which is in Christ Jesus make sure you're proving yourselves brothers says Christ that you have the whole armor of God on and make sure you're proving the brethren and when you see someone that seems like they've dropped or taken off a piece of the armor that's only that's only if it's one praise God you can get them to get that one piece on but it never it starts with one but it never ends with one they take they drop I forgot to mention this you have a sword in this hand, you have a shield in this hand, you've got an armor of God on, it keeps you busy. The only way you can get it messed up with the lust of the flesh or the world is you've got to get a, a free hand. And what's the first hand that you empty? The shield. Above all, taking on the shield of faith. That's the first piece of armor that always seems to be dropped. Then the helmet's usually the second one, getting your eyes off Jesus Christ. So, Brothers Jesus Christ, I hope this has been an exhortation. And I want to sing a quick hymn. By God's grace and mercy, I want to sing day by day. We're supposed to be making sure we have the armor of God on every day, brother says Christ. So I want to sing day by day. Day by day, and with each passing moment, strength I find to meet my trials here. Trusting in my Father's wise bestowment, I have no cause for worry or for fear. He whose heart is kind beyond all measure gives unto each day what he deems best. Loving it's part of pain and pleasure, mingling toil with peace and rest. Every day the Lord himself is near me with the special mercy for each hour all my cares he gladly bears to cheer me he whose name is counselor and power the protection of his child and treasure is a charge that on himself he lay as your days your strength shall be in measure this the pledge to me he made. Help me then in every tribulation, so to trust thy promises, O Lord, that I lose not faith, sweet consolation, offered me within thy holy word. Help me, Lord, when toil and trouble meeting, ere to take us from our Father's hands. One by one, the days, the moments fleeting, till I reach the promised land. Day by day, brothers, says Christ. 
till we get home to be with the Lord in heaven. Once again, grace and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And I praise this, is, this study has exhorted you and encouraged you. Get back in the Word of God and make sure you're living right. You have the whole armor of God on. You're living right. And you're doing right. We don't got much time left. Day by day, brothers of Christ. I'll see you in the next study.